Kim Dayel in Canberra. The protests in Hong Kong have now been going on for three months. With the police response becoming increasingly violent and the protests spreading to countries like Australia, is the government going to stand up for human rights and condemn the Hong Kong government and call for free and fair elections? If not, okay. does the panel believe we are now too reliant on trade with China to stand up for its human rights abuses, both on the mainland and in Hong Kong? Benjamin, sorry, I jumped the gun there. Benjamin, uh, we'll start with you. Yeah, this is, this is kind of a personal question for me because my, my family's in Hong Kong, my cousins, my aunties, my uncles, and I think when we watch the footage um, on the news, uh, sometimes Australians can feel like it's a bit of a remote issue over there. But it's very much an Australian issue, just as the questioner said, because it is coming to Australia. Uh, we are seeing violence play out on university campuses. We are seeing art galleries uh, uh, cancel events that uh, showcase Chinese artists um, and dissidents uh, without giving much of an explanation. Um, we've got an Australian citizen who's currently detained by China. Um, and what's been really upsetting is that that particular writer, Yang Hen Jun, was told by an investigations officer when he was being interrogated um, that Australia was dependent on China for its trade and economy. And Canberra won't help you, let alone rescue you. And when I hear that, I wonder if that's right. And that's something that I think Australians are going to have to confront. We're going to have to have a lot more nuance in our conversation about China. We have to understand the differences between Hong Kong, China, Taiwan. We have to understand the Communist, uh, the, the People's Communist Party um, of China. Uh, we've seen just before Q&A the brutality with which police are acting on protesters. Um, these are, you know, they are beating up civilians just catching the train, sometimes indiscriminately. And because Australia's economy is so married to China and has arguably, our whole story has been married to China for over 200 years now, we have to kind of now question the terms on which that marriage continues, I think. I'll just hear from the other Australian on the panel, Ruby. Mm. Um, you know, I agree. Some of the, 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 the images are shocking, but what I... Well, I'm get concerned about when we sit, we, we have this um, idea that we have to say something, we have to do something, put you know, our, our trade aside and stand up for human rights. But how much is our condemnation going to be worth? And if we can set, step back a little and see ourselves maybe from China's perspective, and I'm not, I'm not you know, going to equate our own human rights abuses are, are, are on the same level necessarily, although and sometimes they can be comparable um, given the history, the colonial history of this country. But you know, is, is China going to necessarily listen and, and think that we have a, the, the moral high ground given, you know, how the Indigenous population is still treated in incarceration rates. You know, there was an inquest all of you know, last week on, on going into the death of an Aboriginal woman in custody, you know, arrested for uh, public drunkenness, allegedly, given the way in which we sequester um, asylum seekers on in offshore detention as if they are a literal contagion to our society that we have to be protected from these these threats to our way of life you know how much is our condemnation worth uh, in that sense why would another government think that we you know should be listened to because we're setting such a fine example and again, I'm not saying it's all exactly the same. There are obviously nuances there, but we, you know, that's just what I think we, we have to sometimes see ourselves from other people's eyes. But I, I don't think the problem is really a question of moral authority. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much more pragmatic than that. Yeah. So uh, e e Australia, I agree, but Australia it's a and, yeah? and, and other countries, of course, mm. uh, would have to. Uh, hurt China in a practical way. Uh, I think they're perfectly capable of ignoring uh, moral criticism. They've certainly, mm. ig ig you know, with the Uyghurs, they've been ignoring up a storm. There's been plenty of press about that issue. And uh, they don't care. You'd have to hurt them economically. But how, how can we hurt... And that, would, that entails making real sacrifices. And I think, I think that Hong Kong 
has the capacity to become a real test of the West. Because if there is another uh, Tiananmen Square style event there, what are we going to do? And, uh, you know, I anticipate probably kind of nothing. Because we're too, we're already too integrated with China, too dependent on China. China has so much U.S. debt. Um, you would, you would have to be able to be make real economic sacrifices on on your own behalf, and and I, I wonder. Ben, I'm going to come back to you, Dore. I want to hear from your perspective. I'm looking at these protesters in. Uh, in Hong Kong, you must feel some sort of sympathy um, given what you've been through. But, I mean, how does it look? Um, I mean, they're having to carry umbrellas because of overhead surveillance cameras cover their faces because they're terrified of being identified by the Chinese security services. Um, the protesters themselves are getting a little more violent, but the response to them is getting much more violent. Yeah, not, even, not necessarily sympathy as much as solidarity. Shout out to the protesters. And I think that people aren't even talking about the scale. Two million people out of roughly seven million people is a lot of people. I mean, that is, that's a lot of people on the street. <laughs> so when you think about, like, the sheer scale of what it means at two million... You know, I was talking to one of the organizers yesterday, and I'm like, how did you move two million people? Like, what, I'm just, like, fascinated by the strategy. Moving two million people is a lot of people, you know? Uh, so I think that that is, like, really impressive. I do think countries can step in and say we're watching, and I don't think that that is small. I think about, like, what it meant for our, us in St. Louis that people, other, like, amnesty came down, and it really put the government on edge to know that people were collecting data and collecting evidence. And they have been genius. So I don't know if you saw that the police are using, put blue dye in the water can, to mm -hmm. mark the protesters, and the protesters were like, prepare for it, had different changes of clothes, like where they were just ready, you know? And you're like, yes, this is great. And uh, tear gas, if you've ever been tear gas, tear gas, uh, hopefully you've not been tear gas, but uh, tear gas canisters are very hot, so they are, they're just hot. And what they're doing that's also really brilliant is that they have people whose role is to just pour water on the canisters. Like the moment the canister hits the ground, they pour water on it and it just dissipates, the, and you're like, that is brilliant. So, mm. if anything, I'm proud of them, and I'm just in awe. I was talking to an organizer, and I asked, what was the difference with this protest? And she said that Facebook Live has been the difference, that there are older people in Hong Kong who, for the first time, see it happening in real time, mm. and they are like, this is real, because everything they'd seen before had been heavily edited. Mm. But two million out of seven million, to me, is a win. Like, that is mm. a lot of people. Uh, I'm gonna go to Steve, um, of course, on the mainland, um, they're not getting anywhere near that kind of coverage. Facebook Live does not exist there. They're not getting live feeds unless they've got some way of getting around uh, the Great Wall of China, as they call it. The, but so, how, what, what are the unique problems for reporters in China at the moment? Well, they just threw out a uh, Wall Street Journal reporter for writing about a family member of uh, the president. and. Um, they keep reporters on renewable visas that are that are essentially a form of uh, coercion. Uh, usually, I think a year at a time. I had a friend of mine was thrown out for reporting on the Uyghurs, essentially just non-renewed. It's hard to really absorb from the outside how far the workarounds of the firewall extend to the Chinese population. Certainly, in the cities, sophisticated Chinese know how to work around it, but. Um, Look, I think what's extraordinary about this is uh, the resilience and the breadth of this protest. Um, we've been covering in uh, protests in Hong Kong periodically for a number of years now, but the, the determination, the resilience, the risk-taking, the, and, and the strength of this protest, I, it's one of the most extraordinary events in the world right now. And I do think it's right that uh, a very easy and and yet meaningful response for Western governments is to tell China we're watching and that if you do go in, uh, you're going to pay a price. And it may be right to be cynical about what price would actually be paid if they did, but the warning is still effective right now. China wants to take advantage of the American retreat from the world under the Trump administration. It wants to be credible across the globe with uh, the entire membership of the United Nations. and so. They, that's part of why they're kind of self-restrained right now, I think, is that they, they don't want to have to pay the price in global opinion. We should raise that price as high as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. okay.